Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Coffee Science Seminar webinar series. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. So our today's uh, presenter is Dr. Hannah Siddell, and she'll be presenting about why we need genetic diversity in immune system. Next slide, please. My name is Ali Raza, and I'm a senior research officer at Center for Animal Science, Coffee Queen, University of Queensland. At the University of Queensland, we acknowledge the traditional honors and their custodianships of the land on which we meet. We pay our respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Next slide, please. I would uh, go through the housekeeping. Uh, today's seminar will run from 12 to 1 p.m. And after the presentation, we will hold a question and answer session. So you are welcome to uh, submit your uh, uh, questions throughout the webinar. And please use Q&A options down the bottom of your screens, uh, not the chat. And we will discuss all the questions at the end. Next slide, please. Our today's speaker is Dr. Hannah Siddell. Um, Hanna is a research fellow at the Center for Animal Science, Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation. Hanna completed her PhD at the University of Queen, uh, Sydney, investigating the evol um, evolution of highly uh, polymorphic major histocompatibility complex genes. She then joined an NHMRC CJ Martin fellowship at the University of Cambridge, working on immune escape in transmissible tumors. In 2013, Hannah took a lectureship position at the University of Southampton. During this time, she won the Julia Bodmer Early Career Scientist Award from the European Federation of Immunogenetics. Last year, she moved back to Australia and started working with our group um, with Professor Ala Tabor in Center for Animal Science on ticks and pathogenic bacteria. Next slide, please. Yep, and um, uh, her, today's topic is diversity in immu immune system. Over to you, Hannah. Thanks very much, Ali. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you very much, Coffee, for the invitation to talk to you about my research. Um, so as Ali uh, said there, I'm quite new to Coffee. I joined in August last year. Um, and I joined Ala Tabor's lab and I'm working alongside uh, um, Ali as well. And the work that I'm doing with Ala is looking at molecular diagnostics for um, different pathogenic bacterial species, uh, picking up some of the tick vaccine and other vaccine projects as well. Um, but because that work is quite new to me, I thought today I would talk about some of the previous work that I've done. And hopefully you can see how some of the threads of that actually apply quite nicely to, to the work that I'm getting to do now. Um, so hopefully it shows as well how you can move around a little bit in your career. You don't have to stay in the same area. Uh, so since doing my PhD quite a long time ago now, I've worked on quite a few different species. So I was lucky enough to work on these cute little guys. So this is a Tamil wallaby. So that was some of my PhD work. I also worked on some American uh, marsupials as well. So this guy, not so cute, is the uh, opossum. And I think you'd have to say that the Australian marsupials, we, we get the cuteness factor a little bit more than the American ones. Um, I've also worked on chickens, um, which was in some of my postdoctoral work. And uh, more recently, I've been working on the Tasmanian devil, which is the story I'm gonna mainly talk about today. Um, and now I'm also working on cattle, which has been um, really interesting as well. So one of the threads that has stayed the same throughout all of these different species is that I've always been really interested in the host pathogen interaction. Um, and in particular, how genes in the immune system underpin this interaction and how important genetic diversity is for the immune response. And this can play into things like vaccine design as well. 
And the genes that I've spent a lot of time working on in my career are these major histocompatibility complex genes, or MHC for short. Um, so the host pathogen interaction has always been really interesting to me because it is kind of like this red queen in, in Alison and in Wonderland. So the red queen has to run faster and faster in order just to keep still where she is. And we can apply that to the host pathogen um, interaction where both are trying to get the upper hand, both um, are evolving over time. Um, and we can apply this to, to how that can work in, in real time and in evolutionary terms. So just in this schematic here, we've got um, a phylogenetic representation down the bottom, and it's been very simple terms showing how we can have a pathogen density in a scenario where the pathogen has the upper hand over the host immune response. And we have very few host immune cells that can actually um, recognize and respond to the pathogen. But over time, we get genetic mutation, we get evolution, and at some point, we may get the host actually getting the upper hand over the pathogen. And the number of immune cells that can identify a pathogen and respond to it um, increase, and pathogen density incre uh, decreases. And this changes then, of course, then over time, as we get this battle for supremacy between the pathogen and the host. Now, some of the genes that are really important for underpinning this arms race are the MHC um, genes. And the reason for this is because that they encode molecules that actually drive the T cell response to an invading pathogen. And that could be a virus, it can be a bacteria, it can be a parasite. So how do these MHC molecules drive this um, immune response? Well, MHC molecules bind to short peptides that can be derived from a virus or a bacteria, and they present these to T cells. And then the T cell makes a decision, is this self or non-self? And of course, if it's non-self and pathogenic, then it can um, attack the invader. Now, MHC molecules broadly come in two types, MHC class one and MHC class two. They both have a very important role to play in the T cell response to, to pathogens. But today in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing mainly on MHC uh, class one molecules, um, but they both have an important, important role to play. So the MHC class one molecule I've just shown here, um, and they're found on the surface of all cells in the body in uh, um, uh, injured vertebrates. Um, so they go all the way from um, to draw from from vertebra all the way through the vertebrate evolution, these these molecules, and they're found on the surface of the cell. They have a transmembrane region that anchors them to the surface. They have um, what we term an alpha chain, or sometimes a heavy chain, and they're associated with a beta two microglobulin, which is just shown here. And their role is to bind short peptides. And these peptides are uh, usually for MHC class one between eight and 10 amino acids long. And they bind to these peptides and they present them on the surface of the cell to T cells. And this happens through the T cell receptor or the TCR. So the T cell receptor will come down, it recognizes this uh, peptide as either being part of self, so a normal self peptide, and then there's no T cell response. But if this peptide has derived from some sort of pathogen, bacteria or virus, then we could get an immune response to, uh, to that uh, virus or, or bacteria. So this is just showing this in, in a slightly um, more complex um, structural model. Um, but what it does really nicely is it shows here, we've got um, uh, two helices um, that form this peptide binding groove. And you can see the peptide in the middle here, so the MHC class one. And this is really the most important, functionally, the most important part of the MHC class one molecule, because this is where it recognizes and binds the peptides presenting it up to the TCR, which is shown in blue here. And what I want you to note here is that the TCR actually comes in and it interacts with both the peptide and also with the MHC class one molecule itself. And this, this interaction is really very specific. And the TCR can tell the difference between just one amino acid change in that peptide. 
So even if you just, in some situations, if you have just one amino acid change that changes what is a self-peptide um, to something that is recognized as from um, a virus or a bacteria, uh, then the uh, TCR can recognize that and the signals will flow back into the, the T cell to activate the immune response. So what I wanna do now is just have a little bit of a closer look at sorry, this binding pocket, which is sometimes known as the peptide binding region or the PBR. So now in A here on the left, we're looking at a bird's eye view down into the MHC class one binding pocket where it takes in the peptide. And this peptide is shown in, in silver. And as I mentioned in MHC class one, this is eight to 10 amino acids. MHC class two, they're just slightly longer than that. And we've got an alpha one helix and an alpha two helices that make up this peptide binding region. Now, the amino acids that line the pocket of this peptide binding region of the MHC class one, they define the biochemical properties of that pocket. And so they determine what sort of a peptide in terms of its amino acids uh, can actually stick and stay bound into that, um, into that MHC class one pocket. So we often term the uh, sequence of amino acids that that particular MHC class one likes to bind to as the peptide motif. So there's many different MHC class one alleles, which I'm going to come on to in a moment, and they will all have a slightly different preference depending on their biochemical, biophysical properties of the peptide binding region. They're going to have a slightly different uh, preference for different amino acids that bind into these pockets. There is some similarities that go through. So for example, this F pocket here generally takes a hydrophobic amino acid um, at um, uh, the C-terminal end of the peptide. Now, the other thing that this, um, these pockets define as well is what we term as anchor residues in the bound peptide. And this can vary between alleles, but generally in mammals, the anchor residues are at P2 of the peptide. So this position here, this is just an example peptide in a MHC that would bind an MHC class one. Um, and also P omega, so the last position on the peptide as well. And these are generally the most important residues for determining binding into the groove. So this is an example of how we sometimes represent these peptide binding motifs. And this is an example from a cattle MHC class one allele. And you can see that for this particular allele, it's similar to most other mammalian in that it prefers a particular residue at P2 and a particular residue, which is, is hydrophobic um, at P omega at position nine here. So once we have an understanding of what the biophysical, biochemical or structural properties are of the peptide binding region of the allele that we're interested in, and then we have an understanding of what perhaps viral peptides are available, we can start to make predictions about what peptides will bind to particular MHC class one and class two molecules. And as I'm going to get into a little bit later, this can be really valuable for then predicting which virally or bacterially derived peptides are gonna stimulate um, the highest level of immune response because they will be the strong binders because we can start to measure the binding affinity. Um, so this is generally done by the disassociation constant. So um, how easily those peptides come in and out of the peptide binding group. So this has been studied um, empirically to get measurements of the KD values, but we can also then start to use that using some algorithms um, to predict what these affinity um, measurements are going to be for different peptides and different alleles. And probably the best known program for doing this is NetMHC. Um, and it, it um, has now expanded beyond humans as well and all, to di all different types of species where some of this information is known. So where do these peptides come from that the MHC molecules bind to? So in the case of MHC class one, these peptides are generally from within the cytosol of the cell. So they're intracellular uh, peptides. For MHC class two, they're most often extracellular, but these are not actually hard and fast rules. They, they do vary. 
But if a virus, say, infects uh, a cell, and this is just showing the cytosol here, then those viral um, uh, proteins, um, along with self proteins as well that are floating around in, in, in the cytosol, um, then get processed through the proteasome. And then they put are processed into short peptides, and then they are transported into the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER here. Now, once they're in the ER, that's when they have the chance to come into contact with an MHC class one molecule. And if that peptide fits nicely with that um, peptide binding region or that pocket that we were just talking about, then that binding will occur. It will be nice and tight if those peptides are not going to fall off. And the MHC class one molecule will, will be trafficked to the cell surface where it can then interact with a T cell. And in the class of, case of an MHC class one, that's going to be a CD8, uh, a CD8 T cell. And we can stimulate an immune response. Um, now, there are, um, each of us will have many of these different MHC class one alleles. And I'll come into why that is in a moment. But if you've got the right allele, and you can bind to the right peptide, that means that you have the potential for a strong immune response. So you can start to see why at a population level, the MHC alleles that you have uh, present can determine whether you have susceptibility to a particular virus or bacteria, or whether you can have resistance to a particular virus and bacteria. And that is indeed what can, can happen in some situations. Now, I also wanted to touch on the fact that these molecules also drive transplant rejection as well. And actually, this is why they were originally uh, discovered. And it was um, Peter Doherty and uh, Robert Zinkenagel that got the Nobel Prize um, many years ago now for actually figuring out what these molecules do. So um, they knew fairly early on and in the very simplest form that if you do skin grafts between two mice with identical MHC um, haplotypes, then your graft will be tolerated. If you have mice with different MHC genotypes, then your graft will be rejected rapidly. And if you have um, minor histocompatibility, so this is where the peptide um, varies, but the actual MHC genotype is the same, your graft will still be rejected, but it will be rejected more slowly. Now, of course, this is what's in the textbooks, but it's not actually always true. And what we understand now about this is that sometimes you can have um, permissive matches. So we're even where your MHC genotype is, um, is different, then you can actually still have permissive graphs that happen. And of course, this has um, implications for um, transplantation. So what do the MHC genes look like in their structure and organization within the genome? Um, and so the classic is the human MHCs because it's, it is the most well studied, it's the most well sequenced. And typically this has been one of the hardest regions of the genome to actually assemble um, correctly. Uh, it's done very well for human and, and a lot of other species now, but it has taken a long time because the MHC class one and the class two genes, so that's just shown um, on the right here and on the left for the class two, they're polygenic as well as being polymorphic. So there's, we have multiple genes and we have multiple, many, many alleles in the population. So it can be very difficult to assemble these regions and long read sequencing is um, making big inroads into that now um, for obvious reasons. I'm not going to talk about the MHC class 3 region today. And every species does this organization differently. And essentially, this is because the MHC region, although it's really um, central to the immune response um, of jawed vertebrates, um, it it's also been under quite intensive um, uh, selection um, because of its role in, in pathogen dynamics. So every species seems to do this a little bit uh, differently. And two that I wanted to highlight because they're quite different from uh, the human MHC is the chicken which is known as a minimal essential MHC. 
So compared to the human MHC region, which is large and complex in its, its gene structure, uh, the chicken MHC is tiny and it only has two MHC class one genes and it only has two classical MHC class, class two genes as well. So it's, it's known as the minimal essential MHC. And interestingly, chickens do have some really stark um, resistance and susceptibility to particular um, uh, pathogens based on the MHC alleles that they have. Um, so whether they could do with a little bit more diversity there um, remains to be seen. The other one that's interesting is actually cattle because uh, cattle and, uh, is a little bit of a, a nightmare in the MHC region because they generate um, additional diversity by varying gene expression between different individuals. So um, you can have different um, genes that are actually turned on, switched on through expression in different individuals in a, in a population. So they're not just generating diversity through having multiple genes and then having many, many alleles, but they're also generating diversity by turning these genes on and off depending on the individual, which is really interesting. And wallabies that I mentioned earlier on, and in particular the Tamar wallaby, they have a very dispersed MHC class 1. So their MHC class 1 genes are, are dispersed across multiple chromosomes, um, which is quite interesting. But all of this means that there is quite rapid evolution in this, in this region. And it means that we see few or orth, true orthologs, or we can't see the orthologous relationships between MHC genes between species. Um, and this is just basically because they form these um, species specific clusters because each species and even at the population level are responding to different pathogens in slightly different ways. So we see this really rapid evolution. And the last thing I wanted to say on this is I've mentioned that we have um, vast numbers of MHC class one alleles, and that is certainly true in humans. So I put the title here that MHC gene diversity increases with sequencing power. Of course, the diversity doesn't increase, it's always there, but our ability to detect this um, genetic diversity has increased exponentially. And that came along with, you can, you can see here, we've got the number of alleles in the human population and the year, and you get an explosion around the time that next generation sequencing really becomes um, mainstream and something that people are doing all the time. And we get this ramping up of the number of alleles, MHC class one alleles that are in the population. And we're up to over 24,000 now, MHC class one alleles in the human population, MHC class two, a little bit lower, but this um, system generates diversity in different ways as well. And if you want to have a look, this is a really great resource. This is the IPD MHC, and um, they provide the nomenclature and uh, a repository for all of the MHC class class one and class two, and that's across species as well. So for example, you can go in and you can have a look at different bovine MHC. So you can see there's 19 genes and we're up to 739 alleles across those. And that's just in um, MHC class one. Um, of course, it's a, a drop in the ocean compared to what we have for human, um, but there's a lot more effort that goes into sequencing the human populations, which of course are very diverse. Okay, so what can we do with all of this now? So I mentioned before that um, obviously with whether you've got in a population an MHC class one that can bind to a particular viral or bacterial um, peptide and that can determine whether the individual can respond or the population as a whole can respond to, to a particular uh, particular pathogen. And so there is selection for diversity and um, the alleles that you have can determine uh, resistance and susceptibility in some cases. Um, but the other sort of direction that this is going in is to be able to design uh, peptide vaccines that are really targeted um, to a particular um, uh, MHC class one alleles or class two alleles that are present in a population. 
So what I mean by this in, in a sort of zoomed out way, and this is quite a complex diagram, but I'll talk you through it. So if you have a peptide vaccine against, say, a particular a virus, so this is a, a viral peptide, then those, are going, those peptides will be taken up by an antigen presenting cell, and they can be um, presented via the MH, MHC class 2 or MHC class 1 pathway to both CD8 T cells and also to CD4 T cells. And in this way, we get activation of the immune system, and then B cell activation, antibodies, and hopefully high levels of immunity. And rather than just taking your viral genome and sort of randomly taking different peptides, if you know something about how those peptides will bind to particular MHC class one and class two, then you can start to target your vaccines in this way. But to be able to do this, you need to know something about the system that you're working in. So you need to know, and I've just put these as bullet points here. So you need to know what MHC uh, genotypes are present in your population, and even better, which of these are actually expressed to make sure that they're, they're being expressed. Because as I mentioned in cattle, not all of these will always be expressed. Um, so you need to know what alleles you have essentially in haplotypes. You need to know what the favoured peptide motif of these um, different MHC class 1 and class 2 are as well. So um, I mentioned before that each MHC class 1 is going to have a particular peptide motif that it favours. You need to know what this peptide motif is. You need to know what the pathogen peptides are. In the situation of a virus or a bacteria, or, well, particularly in a virus, if the genome's smaller, it's easier to chop this up into potential peptides that might be um, immunogenic. Um, but in the case of anti-cancer vaccines, for example, this can be much more complex, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. And we need to know um, which of these pathogen-derived peptides will fit the binding groove best. So this can either be done through um, structural experiments of looking at how the peptide binds to the MHC class 1, or through some of those algorithms that I mentioned before, where we can make predictions based on this. OK, so I'm going to switch tack. I know that was quite a long introduction. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit now about how I've applied some of um, uh, these elements to um, two particular diseases in the Tasmanian devil. Um, most of you will know what a Tasmanian devil is. It's a marsupial species um, and it's found on the island of Tasmania. Um, there is introductions back into the mainland, but it really came to prominence um, uh, about 20 years ago now because of um, a, a devastating transmissible tumour that had emerged in the population and, um, and was, the population was essentially nosediving because of this cancer that was spreading. Um, now, what I mean by transmissible cancers is that these are tumour cells that pass between different individuals in the population. So this is not caused by a pathogen like a virus or a bacteria, but the cancer cells themselves are the pathogen. And they are moving kind of like more like a parasite really than a virus or a bacteria. They are moving between different individuals in that population. Now the Tasmanian devil is not alone in having these tumors. Um, there's also a numerous um, transmissible cancers in uh, bivalve, species of bivalve, so mollusks, um, and they're known as bivalve transmissible neoplasms. There is the canine transmissible venereal tumour, or CTVT, which is the oldest, um, uh, oldest cancer in the world. It's about 10,000 years old. Um, but the Tasmanian devil does have the dubious honour of being the only species where two independent lineages of uh, transmissible tumour have emerged and we term them devil facial tumour 1 and devil facial tumour 2, DFT1 and DFT2. Now when we think about cancer and the immune response we come actually back to a host pathogen interaction again um, so the red queen pops up again. Um, and this is because I just wanted to reinforce that actually tumours interact, even in, in single organism tumours, they interact with the immune system in much the same way as a pathogen. They try and escape, the immune system tries to target them. Um, and they generate diversity, they generate subclonal diversity, which is represented here in this diagram with different coloured dots. Um, and as those mutations develop, that may give particular sublineages the ability to metastasize. To 
to new organs. Um, and in the case of our transmissible tumors, we see that metastasis as that tumor cells move into the next individual. So that's kind of like a metastasis, but into a whole new individual. Um, and uh, this can also, these mutations can then also give those tumor cells the ability to escape from, from the immune response. So these transmissible tumors we think um, pass by biting in the Tasmanian devil. We don't actually have empirical evidence of that, but the tumors, which this is what they look like when they're quite advanced, they're pretty nasty, and they, um, they do pre pre occur predominantly around the face and the neck. And the devils bite each other predominantly around the face and the neck um, over food and, and for mates. They're not the nicest of <laughs> animals around each other. Um, but unfortunately, after the cells embed, we know that within six months to a year, the tumours can look like this. They become very large, very ulcerated. Um, they inhibit the ability of the devils uh, to feed. They lose body condition. And the tumours do have very high mortality rate because there's very little immune response that occurs um, to them. They are completely different genetic lineages, so they emerged in different individuals at different times. DFT1, we think, is about 25 years old. DFT2 is much younger. It was only discovered in um, 2014. Interestingly, though, they both derived from Schwann cells, uh, Schwann cell origin. And they have these morphological similarities. So this is just showing where the gene geographically in Tasmania, the tumors emerge. So DFT1 in the Northeast and DFT2 in the Southeast. DFT2 still has a very restricted geographic um, distribution compared to DFT1. Now I mentioned that they're very morphologically similar. They came from um, the same uh, progenitor cell, a Schwann cell, which is a type of nerve cell, but they are genetically distinct. They arose in different individuals. And this is just showing the karyotype of the tumor. So this is a normal Tasmanian devil karyotype up the top. And then we have the DFT1 karyotype and the DFT2 karyotype. And DFT2 emerged from a male Tasmanian devil, whereas DFT1 um, uh, emerged from a female. As well. um, so it's a little bit different. Now, both tumours are now generating subclonal diversity in as they spread across Tasmania. DFT1 um, has a much more complicated um, uh, structure than DFT2 population structure because it has been evolving and has been present in the population for longer. Um, and DFT2 has the more a narrow geographic range. This is just showing a comparison of the DFT2 uh, and DFT1. And this is um, using SNPs that were found across the genomes compared to host animals. And you can see how the DFT2 tumors cluster together and the DFT1 away from the host individuals. But DFT2 is now playing, playing catch up to DFT1, and they do, we think, are com actually competing against each other in the population as well as against their host. Um, and while DFT1 has split into these very distinct clades, and we do see some um, evidence of extinction of some of these, um, of these uh, clades, DFT2 split early on into two different lineages. Um, and has um, it seems to be evolving and acquiring its genetic mutations faster than DFT1, uh, but its population structure is still more simple than DFT1. So some work that um, I did very early on um, to try and get an understanding of why these tumours can pass between the ind individuals without an immune response was to start looking at the MHC molecules because this seemed a very sensible place to start and it was something that I, I, I knew a lot about already. And what we found early on was that the DFT1 cells, and here I've just shown a few different uh, DFT1 cell lines, um, that they don't express MHC class one or elements of the MHC class one pathway. Oh, sorry. Um, and if we do some flow cytometry on these cell lines, um, we can see that in this is the gray is just showing um, the, the DFT1 cells that don't express beta-2M, which is a proxy for MHC class one in this case. But if we treat these cells with interferon gamma, an inflammatory uh, cytokine, we can stimulate expression of MHC class one. And this is just showing that this can occur in vivo as well in some histological sections. 
Um, and this was actually a really interesting idea because it meant that, yes, DFT1 cells didn't weren't normally recognised by the immune response, so there's no MHC molecules, so T cells can't recognise them. But we thought, is this a way that then we can stimulate the immune system to see these cells, right, by stimulating MHC plus one and using this as, as a whole cell vaccine? I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But in the meantime, DFT2 had popped up. And when we looked at DFT2, we assumed that it would not express MHC class 1 molecules either. But we were actually very surprised to find that the DFT2 cells, in contrast to DFT1, express MHC class 1 molecules. And that's just um, shown here in R, DFT2, RV, SN, and 5, 4, 9, you can see the MHC class one expression here. And we can boost this up a little with interferon gamma as well in DFT, DFT2, but with DFT1, we have nothing. Now, interestingly, and slightly worryingly, when we started to have a look at DFT2 tumors um, over time and in different geographical locations, we actually found that um, it appears that MHC class one is being lost in DFT2. So we, this was some early staining that we did and we still found some tumors where we still had strong MHC class one, which is in brown here in the tumor cells, but we have other sections where we see very little staining for MHC class one. And we've been able to extend some of this analysis out now um, with a lot more tumor samples and can confirm that pretty much after 2018, we don't see many tissue sections from tumors anymore with MHC class one. So this tumor is in the process of escaping for the, in the, from the immune system. So DFT1 is shown here on, on this left-hand side. And really it is it would have had MHC class one expression at some point, but it has lost it now. And so we really think there's not much selective pressure from lymphocytes anymore on DFT1. The devil immune system just doesn't respond to it very well at all. And then DFT2 shown here on the right is a little bit different. So we still have MHC class one, but it is being lost over time. Now I mentioned before, just check the time, oh yeah, all right. Um, that we were trying to develop a whole cell vaccine to, to uh, DFT1. Um, and the idea behind this was to treat these cells with interferon gamma and then put them into the devils to see how they responded. And I'm not going to go through all of the data generated on this, but I put some references down the bottom. But um, the upside of this was that it was a very inconsistent immune response that we would see to these MHC positive um, DFT1 cells, which was a little bit disappointing. In some instance, in some individuals, we saw an immune response, but it wasn't consistent across all individuals. So we started thinking, can we come up with a way, a more targeted way, to find out what the true antigens are here. And one of the ways that we've been doing this is by having a look at this, what we call the immunopeptidome of the tumors. So that is all of the peptides, the MHC uh, class one peptides that I was talking about before. Can we take all these peptides off and sequence them? And this is just showing a little flow of how we did this. So we took fibroblast, devil fibroblast cells, a lot of them, um, DFT1 with interferon gamma and DFT2 cells. We extract off the MHC class one off the cell surface, and then we sequence, elute out the peptides and sequence these peptides with um, mass spectrometry. And at the same time, we also took off the MHC class one heavy chains as well. So we could see exactly what was on the cell surface. And as with many of these types of projects, actually what was the really hard bit was the data analysis. So trying to get an understanding of what the peptides were on these MHC class one that contained uh, mutations that might be immunogenic to the immune system. And this really involved comparing the peptides and the proteomes from DFT1, DFT2, um, and a fibroblast cell line we used as well. So what did we find? Well, the first thing that really struck us was actually how similar in terms of the MHC class one heavy chains and the allele names are just shown here in this table, how similar these MHC class one heavy chains were across fibroblasts, DFT1 and DFT2. So we only really found one, um, oh, that's in the wrong spot, sorry. Sorry, it should be in this, uh, oh, 
yeah, sorry, it should be one up this the red the red square here in 7488, um, because that's the only allele on the surface of these cells that we found that was actually different in DFT2 compared to the other the other cell lines. And DFT1 had a very had a very small repertoire of MHC class one heavy chain that we could actually found on the cell surface. The other thing we found found was fairly sort of straightforward, really, in that the peptide length for the MHC class one, if we have compare fibroblast DFT1 and DFT2, they're mostly eight mers, nine mers, 10 mers. So that's pretty standard across, across mammals for MHC class one peptides. Um, what was interesting though, is that in fibroblasts and DFT2, they seem to be a preference for eight mers. Um, and usually you see a preference for, for nine mers, um, which we did see in DFT1 um, stimulated with interferon gamma. Um, but what we were really interested in and what we wanted to find out was what is that peptide binding motif that these MHC class one molecules prefer? And can we find um, peptide antigens that have mutations in them that are different uh, or are uh, unique to DFT1 and DFT2 that might be immunogenic? Um, and so to look at this, I know this is not the nicest of slides to have a look at, but I just want to... Um, this is just showing how we have our, um, we have fibroblasts here, DFT1 and DFT2. And on the left-hand side, we have all the AMAs that we found um, in those MHC class one, off the MHC class one. And on the right-hand side, we have the NIMAs. And then we do a classification of whether particular amino acids are either dominant, so found in more than 30% of peptides, strong or moderate. And we do that for each of the, the cell lines. And the thing that dropped out of this is, is two things, really. Well, there was a hydrophobic preference at P omega, so P8 and P9, that's fairly standard for mammals. Um, but the thing that was interesting is rather than having an anchor at P2, which we would expect from, from most of the other mammalian MHC class one, we seem to have a preference for an anchor at P3, which is interesting. And this seemed to be primarily leucine in all three of the cell lines even though they're, they're different cell lines, they come from different individuals. So we would have expected to see a little bit more diversity in the peptide motif there, yes. Okay, and then we took two approaches for looking at neoantigens. The first thing we did is we looked at, we took the um, peptides and we looked at the expression level of their proteins between DFT1 and DFT2 compared to fibroblasts. Um, and the reason that we were interested in, in this is because we wanted to make sure that if we discovered neoantigens, that they were peptides that were coming from proteins that had high levels of expression within these cells. And it would be even better if they had high levels of expression in DFT1 and DFT2. So we were able to identify um, some uh, uh, proteins that had high levels of expression and were giving us peptides on the cell surface. And when we looked at whether any of these had um, mutations in them compared to fibroblasts or um, allelic differences, if you like, or SNPs between these, we actually found a number of candidates, but only, unfortunately, in DFT1. So none of these had, this, had similar mutations in DFT2, which is perhaps not, ex uh, not unexpected. It would be very difficult to find um, the same um, the same peptides coming up in DFT1 and DFT2. But these are the ones that we had identified um, as potential candidates going forward for um, vaccination. So just to conclude, so DFT2 in the Tasmanian devil looks to be losing MHC class one expression. Um, and we speculate that this is perhaps because of selective pressure as it moves to new, um, encounters new hosts with different genotypes. Um, this is a bit of a problem because uh, DFT1 obviously lost expression of MHC class one um, before it was even uh, characterized as a, as, as a transmissible tumor. And it potentially means that DFT2 is gearing up to start spreading really um, significantly through the population. DFT1 and the host seem to have reached an equilibrium such. So 
perhaps not in such an arms race anymore. Um, and in some parts of Tasmania, the, the devil population is actually starting to recover, which is great news. But um, we may start to see now because of DFT2 spreading, those populations starting to crash out again, but that remains to be seen. We also think that perhaps some of these polymorphisms in the MHC class one molecules are hidden by a common peptide motif. And I think it's very likely that the DFT1 and DFT2 tumors are capitalizing on this to become transmissible. Um, so initially, perhaps MHC class one expression doesn't matter so much because it's quite easy for the tumors to spread because they, they match their MHC essentially and peptide binding to, to the host that they encounter. And the devil MHC class one molecules bind a conventional peptide link, um, uh, but they do have this unconventional P3 leucine anchor. Um, and finally, that these DFTs seem to express a restricted repertoire of MHC class one protein, and that might may limit the immunogenicity between hosts. So what's next? Well, I am leaving a lot of this work behind at the moment. So, but the good news is that some vaccine trials are going to happen later this year with some of the candidate peptides. And Andy Flies at University of Tasmania is currently making some constructs where they're putting particular MHC class one um, alleles um, in with the peptide um, candidates. And these will be um, these will be trialed as an immune, as a vaccination strategy against the tumor, which is exciting. And for me, the next things that I'm doing is continuing with these these molecular diagnostics of pathogens in cattle, and um, we're particularly um, working on Campylobacter um, detection in cattle. I've been also oh, helping with some of the work on new trials for cattle tick vaccine, um, and on the R Australis genome, and helping Ali with some of the biomarker work as well. And that's all I have. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge, um, this is very much an acknowledgement of the people that helped me with the, the all of that devil work. Um, so we had some fantastic collaborators. University of Tasmania was really, really key to this. Um, some colleagues at University of Southampton, um, Monash University, Tony Purcell, and Sri and University of Cambridge, Max and, and Liz, because I've had some wonderful collaborators and, and also some um, fun, really good funders as well of this, of this work. Um, and that's all I have. So I'm very happy to take any questions in the Q&A uh, function if you have any. Thank you, Anna. That was a really interesting talk and uh, a lot of uh, new information about the Tasmanian devils and, and the immune response against the cancer cells. Um, so do we have any questions? Um, yeah, so there's a question from John Harvey. I have some, is DFT1 and 2 spread through biting? Maybe Tasmanian devils bite each other often? And the second mm -hmm. question is, What's the current approach for treating DFT A1 and 2? Can a dual vaccine against DFTs be developed since both DFT1 and 2 share MHC class 1 alleles? Mm. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. So yeah, the, it, they do pass the cells through through biting. Um, no one's actually been able to find evidence. So you can see often see the bite wounds on the Tasmania devil's faces. So you can kind of see um, these wounds coming coming in. No one's ever been able to actually swab to see whether there are tumor cells in there. Um, but it, it's certainly true that the tumours always occur around the face and the necks of the animals. So um, it would appear that they're, that they're embedding these cells in. And it does take some time for then the tumours to develop. Um, and then, yeah, a dual vaccine would be the dream. I think the idea at the moment is to see how this um, vaccine against DFT1 goes. Um, and then maybe perhaps some more work could be done to find, we didn't find any um, appropriate peptides in DFT2. Uh, there's a better genome now than when we were doing that analysis. So I think it is possible to find something that works against both. Yeah. Thank you. There's another question. Um, is this method of transmission for cancer cells unusual for tumors or specific to Tasmanian devils? Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, 
many, many tumours, and this is true in humans as well, have the potential to transmit. Um, and actually you see, you see the transmission of cancer cells across um, the fetal maternal interface. Um, you can see it during, they used to see it a lot during blood, trans, um, blood transfusions, even during surgeries. So tumor cells inherently have the ability, they evade the immune, immune system. So if they can evade another immune system, then, you know, that's possible. But I think what Tasmanian devils have that is unique is they had lower levels of genetic diversity. The cancers had very specific MHC genotypes, which allowed for transmission, um, and they're very aggressive tumours as well. But I don't think you would see this happening, I guess, in very often. And it's why we don't see it happening very often in, in other species, because it really needs um, it needs a very sp uh, specific and rare combination of features in the host and in the cancer to be able to get that transmission going. And I think same, same happens with the canine transmissible uh, venereal transmission um, um, cancer. It's, yeah, it's a it, it's actually a sexually transmitted disease, yeah. and the tumors um, occur around the genitalia. So. Again, it probably occurred in the distant past in um, groups of dogs that had lower genetic diversity. I mean, that's kind of speculation, but that's quite likely. Um, there was at one point, the, the exact time of emergence of CTVT is not really known, but it perhaps happened um, during in wolves or in domestication of dogs, um, perhaps where genetic diversity was, was then reduced um, and it got a foothold. And then, you know, once, once these tumours, though, become established in the population, it's very difficult to get rid of them. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from anyone? Yep, nothing in the chat. Yep, so I would like to ask one question, uh, Hana. How do you see applying some of this knowledge, especially the vaccine development from, uh, from your previous work to the major challenges in, um, in Australian cattle industry? Yeah, well, um, I think that's that's a really interesting idea. And uh, I guess in the introduction, the some of the um, algorithms that now are available to be able to match particular pathogenic peptides to MHC alleles, and this is starting to be used a lot in the agricultural space as well. Um, so in cattle, in chicken, and so I think we're going to see a lot more. Um, of this in terms of vaccine design and to improve um, vaccine strategies to be able to match particular peptides to particular MHC. Um, so I think that would be a really interesting space um, to look at. The other thing as well is that um, it has been a little bit difficult, particularly in cattle that has a very complex MHC region. So the actual organization and structure of the MHC in different breeds of um, cattle has not been very well defined, but the long read sequencing has changed that quite a lot. And and um, there's been a few papers recently where um, they've been able to redefine the, the particular haplotypes in, in cattle. So I think that that area will explode a little bit now because with that new sequencing and with that new um, data on the genomes, it makes it a lot easier to do that kind of work. So I think that could be really interesting, interesting space for improving vaccine design. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Um, I think that's all for today. So if we move to the next slide, we don't have any questions anymore. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us and our next week's coffee science seminar series is the chromosomal level genome assembly and annotation of Australian citrus uh, presented by Ms. Upoli um, Nakan Nakandala and uh, she's from Center for Crop Science uh, at Coffee. Next slide, please. I would skip that next one, please. And if you're interested to present um, your work uh, through some coffee science seminars, 
uh, you're welcome to um, contact uh, our, our coordinator, Craig Gardner, at the email. And uh, you can also watch the recordings of the previous seminars on our um, Coffee Science Seminar webpage. And you're welcome to commun uh, communicate with the science uh, committee at the email given here. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Hannah. Bye.